It's again my privilege to introduce Cardinal Theodore E. McCarrick, Archbishop Emeritus of Washington. For those who were not here last night, let me explain that the 76-year-old Cardinal is retired. And as he said, he's thinking of taking a full-time job so he can slow down. <laughs> 48 hours ago, he was in Washington, D.C. 34 hours ago, he landed in Auckland. And in that time, he's already given one talk, celebrated mass, done some media interviews, been around the diocese, and he's prepared for today's speech and tomorrow's talk, and he's ready to celebrate two more masses. And I'm not sure I heard a rumor that he cooked lunch today because he was bored. That may not be true. Cardinal McCarrick was ordained a priest in 1958. So next year, please God, will be his golden jubilee. His service to the church is simply remarkable. And let me mention just a few things. He's talked about in 1971 to 77, he was secretary for Terence Cardinal Cook in New York, a very, very holy man. In 1977, on the 29th of June, he was named Auxiliary Bishop of New York. That's an interesting date, 29 June 1977. That's the same date that our own Dennis Brown became a bishop. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has asked Cardinal McCarrick to do many, many things during his time. He's been asked to head committees on immigration, on international policy, on doctrine, on laity, on missions. In 2001, he was installed as Archbishop of Washington, D.C., and that same year he was elevated to the College of Cardinals by John Paul II. In 2005, he was one of 115 cardinals who participated in the conclave that elected Pope Benedict XVI. He described the experience as humbling and even kind of scary. He has been a leading voice in the Catholic Church in the United States for years, and he continues to be so, whether he's retired or not. And now we are blessed to have him with us to talk about hope. I'm delighted to introduce His Eminence, Cardinal Theodore e. McCarrick from Washington, D.C. Bill does this. This is the second time he's done it now. And uh, I, I have the feeling that I, I, I say, remember the story of the, the, the uh, Irish wake and the, uh, the, the, the widow was sitting there with, her ch with one of her sons and the, the fellow started talking about the husband. And he said, ah, oh, he said, in all my years, I've never known a better man. He was such an honest man, such a hard worker. He was so good to the people. What a wonderful husband. Oh, he was so good to his wife. And what a grandfather. He took care of all this, and the widow was listening to all this, and she hits a boy, and she says, Quick, Paddy, go up and look in the coffin. I think they've switched the bodies. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel after they say all those nice things. I was talking to Father Smith in the hall, and a lady came over, and she said, Are you well rested? And I said, Well, I think I am, but we'll find out during the next uh, 45 minutes. And Father Brown said, well, if you fall asleep while you're talking, then we'll know. <laughs> now, if you fall asleep while I'm talking, that's all right. You're allowed. Yesterday, we spoke about faith and about how important faith was, and it's the very beginning of everything. I, I didn't have my little book here because I thought we were going to go back and change and then come back. And there was a quotation that I wanted to give you, so I... Let me give it to you now, just so I, 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 I know that, that you, we put all things together. This is the beginning of Pope Benedict's apostolic constitution on the sacrament of love, where he talks about the Eucharist. And I thought it was so important because it ties in faith and the sacrament of the Eucharist all together. Holy Father says, as he begins this, the mystery of faith, with these words, 
spoken immediately after the words of consecration, the priest proclaims the mystery, read my writing, the priest proclaims the mystery being celebrated and expresses his wonder, great words, the priest expresses his wonder before the substantial change of bread and wine into the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, a reality which surpasses all human understanding. The Eucharist is the mystery of faith par excellence, the sum and summary of our faith. The faith of the church is essentially a Eucharistic faith. Those are beautiful words, and those are the words with which the Holy Father begins his, uh, his very, very moving and very eloquent description of the Eucharist as, as the foundation of, of our faith. That's why yesterday I wanted to start with that. Now, today I want to move on to hope. But first I have to tell you a story about Bishop Dunn. This is a story about Bishop Dunn as a child that nobody knows. He didn't tell me this story, but everybody in the family knows it, and I got it, I guess, from them. When Bishop Dunn was very young, he was always very hungry. That's why he's so skinny today. <laughs> and when he was in school, he was in a Catholic school, he would, if he saw apples or anything like that, he would put two in his pocket, and one in his bag, and one in his hand, and one in his mouth. and. Uh, sister saw this and one day she had a big bowl of apples right at the beginning of the line where the kids go in order to get their food and as they were going in uh, she she realized that bishop dunn was going to take a number of apples and it wouldn't be enough for everybody else so she put a big sign there she said please be aware that you are only to take one apple remember god is watching so the bishop walks up the line, he starts it, and then he receives the sign. And being a holy man, as he even was as a child, he put the other, the, the other six apples he had put in his pockets, he put them back out, and he only kept one. But he's mad, because he really loves those apples. And as he went through the line, picking the rest of his food up, he still got annoyed. At the end, he saw a big bowl of chocolate chip cookies. So he said, ha. Huh. So he picks out his pen and he makes a sign himself, and he puts the sign up there, and it says, take as many chocolate chip cookies as you like, because God is watching the apples. <laughs> I want to talk about hope. Faith and hope are our sisters. Faith and hope are partners. If, if you do not have faith, you cannot have hope. Because if you do not know who Jesus is, you do, if you do not know how much God loves you, if you do not remember that, that God so loved the world, as we read in the scriptures, God so loved the world that he sent his only son to be our savior and to be like us in all things but sin. If we don't know that, then how are we going to have hope? How are, we going to have, how are you going to trust a God whom, whom you don't believe? But if you know who God is, if you know what God has done in your life, if you know that God sent his son so that he might be our salvation through a terrible suffering and death on the cross and a rising from the dead in glory, unless you know that, then you're not going to have hope in him. So faith is first. And if you have faith, then, then hope follows. But hope without faith is impossible because how are you going to have the trust unless it's someone you know? We talk this weekend about the face of God, the face of Christ. And thank God that uh, Mr. Pervin gave us such a beautiful example of that in presenting to us the face of Jesus Christ. And it is because we need to have, everybody needs to have something to hope in. Say it better. Everyone needs to have someone to hope in. Imagine if you never had anybody you really trusted, what your life would be. Life would be terrible. You need, we all need someone to trust. We all need someone to, to 
to put our hope in and our life in. We all need someone who is going to be able to say to us, it's going to be okay. I will take care of you. I will be there for you. Monsignor basically said that to us this, during this wonderful, his wonderful talk this last hour. We all need somebody to hope in. We all need somebody to trust. I'm going to tell you a story that where I became so conscious of the virtue of hope. It was, go back to John Paul II, this John Paul the Great. It was his first trip to New York. I had become a bishop the year before, and I had met him about two years before when he came to New York. And he, always, he remembered people, always remembered people. Well, he came to St. Patrick's Cathedral, the great cathedral of New York, and a bunch of us were there. And, and he had the, I guess it was a morning prayer, because it was early in the morning. It was the time when Archbishop Fulton Sheen came, and Fulton Sheen was like 80 at the time. And John Paul II was 58, 59, full of vim and vigor as, we, as we've never seen a pope in, since blessed Pius IX, probably uh, 140 years before. And he embraced uh, Archbishop Sheen and, and thanked him for his service to the church. Then he talked. He gave a short but wonderful talk and he spoke about the church in the United States. And what he said about the church in the United States, you could say about the church in New Zealand. Uh, it's, it's holy people, it's sufferings, it's growth, it's struggles, it's, it's great faith. The, the, the real miracles that are going on every day that are only known to those of us who, who deal in miracles. And he said, and all this has happened because we have placed our trust in the living God. Now I had read that line in the epistles so often, but this was the first time it, it grabbed me to place our trust in the living God. And since then, I'm gonna be a bishop 30 years in June. Since then, I, I have always prayed that God will give me this gift of trusting trusting in, in him. I don't have it yet, and I think many of us don't have it yet, because we, we're so used to living in a material world. We're so used to, to weighing things, to measuring things, to saying, well, something, I'll give you some of this, but not some of that. We're so used to holding back that it's hard for us to trust. But God needs us to trust him. He needs us to believe in him, obviously, because if we don't believe in him, we can have no relationship with him. But our relationship with him has to be such that it is a relationship of deepest trust. We have to understand that he loves us so much, he will never let us down. Earlier today, when, uh, when, when Brad and Joe were speaking, that lovely couple that's about to be married, the, the quotations that she took from the Old Testament, which, which her fiance read, spoke about that trust. And it was, it was wonderful to see how someone who, who was going through life and, and trying to find the way that the Lord is, is put, putting out for the two of them, that she would find the secret of it all in trusting the Lord. And finding in the Old Testament those story and story and story of, of his trust. The Psalms are filled with them. But I put my trust in you. In you, I put my trust. In every other Psalm, and I look for it now because, as I said to you earlier, I have a problem with trusting. And, and so I look for it every time I read the Psalms. And it's there. I don't think there's a day that the priest reads the breviary without one of the Psalms saying, I put my trust in you, O Lord. That great line in the Old Testament where the Lord says to his people, can a mother forget the child of her womb? Yea, even if she would forget, I will not forget you. That's how much the Lord is saying, trust me. I will not forget you. The New Testament is, is filled with it too. 
the words of Jesus. Don't we find time and time again, Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans. I will always be there for you. Jesus says in that wonderful threefold promise, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. He doesn't put limits on that. He doesn't say ask if you're my friend. Remember in, in the one, that wonderful letter to the Hebrews we read that he offered his life for us even when we were enemies. We were, he had not yet redeemed us. We, was, we were still caught in our sin and even then he loved us so much that he offered his life for us. And if he does that, should we not trust him? Years ago, one should not speak about one's own confessions, although you're family, so I can do it. I was confessing to my confessor and saying, no, I didn't trust the Lord enough. And, and, uh, and he said to me, and I always remember this, and I tell it to you, so it may help you too. He said to me, he said, you know, Ted, your problem is that you don't trust the Lord enough. Look, he's trusted you, I was Archbishop of Newark at the time, he's trusted you with a million and a half Catholics don't you think you ought to put a little trust in him too? I've never forgotten that. Not that I've followed it, but we're all like that. But, you know, how much he trusts us. He's given, he's given me the chance of taking a piece of bread between thumb and forefinger, and, and he comes whenever I ask him to. And you come and see that happen, and, and it's for you, it's not just for me, it's for you too that he comes. Every time we offer mass, it's for you too that he comes. That's how much he loves you and me. That's how much we mean to him. That's how much we mean to him. We need to have someone into, which, into whom we can put our trust. And it has to be somebody we know, and we know Jesus. How tough it would be if we did not know Jesus. How difficult it would be. I, I looked in, I read, Bishop, I'm staying with Bishop Pat, I read the, the paper today. The paper today in, 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 in Auckland is like the paper in Washington. It tells of the problems of the world, the, the crimes, the difficulties, the, 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 the breakups of happiness. And I said, if I didn't trust in Jesus Christ, just reading the paper would, would, would drive you crazy. Just reading the paper would, would make you so filled with sorrow that you couldn't carry it by yourself. How do people who do not believe continue to live in our world? I don't know. Sometimes when somebody says to me, oh, you're a priest. I said, yeah. And they say, well, I used to be a Catholic. And I always say to them, I, I, over the years I've done this, I always say to them, oh, how can you live without the Eucharist? And they get uncomfortable, and I don't really want them to be uncomfortable, but I, it's a question. How can you live without the Eucharist? How can, once you know what the Eucharist is in your life, once you know that that the Lord comes down to feed you, to give you strength, so that you may have life and have it eternally. Suppose you didn't have that. Suppose suddenly somebody said, no more communion, no more mass, no more Eucharist. I don't know how I would survive, and I don't know how you would survive, because we have learned and this is what we are here for, to learn more profoundly, more deeply, with more joy and more feeling and more love. That he who loves us so much wants us to trust him. Wants us, with the faith that we have, to take that faith and do something with it. And live our lives with it. 
And we are living in a time where the virtue of hope may be the most important virtue of our, of our times, of our years. I, I, I promise uh, uh, Father Rory that I won't talk too much about the Divine Mercy because he's going to do it tomorrow. And what uh, Monsignor said, I don't want Father Rory to have to tear up his talk because of what I say, I say today. But you can't talk about hope and trust without talking about the Divine Mercy. And again, my friend, our friend, John Paul II, when he canonized St. Faustina, some of you may remember this, when he canonized St. Faustina in the year 2000, the beginning of the millennium, he said, I am giving you a saint for the new millennium because the virtue that the church and the world needs most now is the virtue of hope and trust. And so the Lord himself realizes this today. This is why Faustina was given that, that extraordinary blessing as secretary of the mercy of God and told to write under the painting, Jesu Ufam Tobia, Jesus, I trust in you. That's the mantra of our faith in our time because with faith in the Lord's mercy, we move to say, I trust you, Jesus. I put my trust in you. I trust nothing or no one as much as I trust you. And therefore, I will follow you all the days. I discovered a little while ago in my life a, a great Jesuit saint of the 17th century who was just canonized by John Paul II, who seemed to love these saints who talked about confidence. Saint Claude de la Colombière, who was a Frenchman, a French Jesuit. I don't know how many of you have heard about him. He was the confessor and director of Saint Margaret Mary. Saint Margaret Mary, who was a nun in a small town in, in France, received the, the great revelation of the Sacred Heart and the wonderful love that is, that is personified in a special way in the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And he appeared to her many times. And in the monastery where she lived, she, she would explain to, to the Mother Superior, I'm seeing the Lord. And they were hard, they were hard on her because it was a time when, when they were playing down these extraordinary phenomena and they, they didn't want her to, they thought she was crazy or something. And she would, she, she prayed to the Lord, she said, give me someone I can talk to. Give me someone I can trust, like we were saying just before. Give, Lord, give me somebody I can trust. You, you're giving me these great revelations, you're telling me all about your love, you're telling me about the secrets of your heart, you're giving me all these great, wonderful revelations, you're talking to me all the time. Lord, I'm scared, because I have nobody to share it with. They don't believe me here. Lord, send me somebody. And he said to her, on one of his revelations, and, well, let me tell you the story first. He said to her, he said, my daughter, I will send you someone. I will send you someone who will be a wonderful counselor because he is my perfect friend. Imagine being told by the Lord that you were his perfect friend. And there's a life of St. Claude that's called the perfect friend. And Claude came, and Claude was a blessing. He was a lifesaver for St. Margaret Mary because saints understand each other. And he put her at ease, and, and, he, and, he was, and she was able to survive this overwhelming burden, challenge, wonder of God's talking to her face to face through Jesus Christ our Lord. Claude de la Colombière is called the Apostle of Hope because his sermons are so filled with it. He, he often would, would talk about confidence in the Lord and say, I have confidence that my sins will be forgiven 
And I know they will be because I wouldn't have this confidence if they weren't going to be. And he sort of gets the Lord into a puzzle. And Jesus says to him, keep talking. And this is his teaching. Confidence in the Lord. The Lord is not going to let you be forgotten. What we sang when Monsignor was leaving. You know, remember, remember. remember. Be with me, Lord, because I need you. Be with me, Lord, because you promised that you would always be with me. Be with me, Lord, because nothing I will ever do in my life that is good will ever be forgotten. Go back for a moment to that wonderful epistle to the Hebrews. In chapter 6, verse 10, there's a great line. I will not forget the good that you have done. You know, and sometimes in the, in, in, the, in the scriptures you read, if the good man stops being good, then he's damned. If the bad man becomes, stops being good, then he's saved. But the first part is, is tough because if you make one mistake, the letter, the letter to the Hebrews assures us I will not forget the good you have done. I think for all of us, that's, that's something we hang on to. So let's make sure that in our lives we do some good. Let's make sure in our lives we do accomplish what the Lord wants us to accomplish, that we do obtain from the Lord what we need to obtain. I want to tell you a story that I probably shouldn't tell you because it, it's, uh, it's about the conclave and you know we take an enormously powerful oath of secrecy about the conclave. But I have figured out that I can tell you enough without violating, without violating my, my vow. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is the story. And I, then the reason I'm gonna tell it to you because it is a story of confidence. When the cardinals come to elect a pope, and especially to elect a pope after this extraordinary John Paul II. They, there is a, as, as a Bill mentioned when you introduced me, it's, it's scary because you know that you're gonna to try to listen to the Lord, you're gonna to try to pick the right person, and you wanna get somebody who'll be able to follow John Paul II. Before I tell you the story, let me do a, you know I'm a storyteller. Let me tell you a short story about, about when I went to Rome and before we went into conclave, I would walk around and, and the, 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 the lines to see John, to pay respects to the body of John Paul II were enormous. One of my seminarians who was studying at the North American College in Rome came back and I said, where were you? He said, I was, I was online. I said, oh wow, how long were you online? He said, 16 hours. People were online for 24 hours. It was the largest funeral in the history of the world. I said to some of the Indian bishops, I said, how many people came to Gandhi's funeral? Because I thought that would be the only thing where it might have been comparable to the, to the, the funeral for, for John Paul II. And, and they said maybe a million and a half people. But there were five million people in Rome for that funeral. They came from all over the world. And one day, I, I looked at my watch because I shouldn't tell stories because otherwise I'll make you late. I'll make myself late because I have the mass. But one day I was walking along and this lady was on the line and she looked very tired. And I, well, I'm, I love people, so I, I went over to her and I said, you look tired. She said, I am a little. Uh, I said, have you been online long? She said, oh yeah, said, but I keep getting on it again and again. <laughs> and I said, wow, you're very faithful. She said, well, you know, I knew him. I said, oh, isn't that wonderful? She said, yes, no, he was my friend. I said, oh, what, where are you from? She said, I'm from Mexico. And she began to tell me the story. He said, when I was like seven years old, he came for the first time to Mexico. Remember, he came to Puebla about a year after his, uh, his, his election as Pope. And he was in a, 
he was in Mexico City, and he was in the Pope Mobile. And they drove through the city from the cathedral to the airport. And there were hundreds of thousands of people on every block. Mexico is a city of like 25 million, so there were people about six deep on every block. And this lady said to me, my mother, I was little, so my mother said, here, sit on the curb. They weren't letting adults get that close, but little children, they would, the police would let sit on the curb. And he passed by in the Pope Mobile, and he waved to me and smiled. So you see, I knew him. <laughs> and you know, I am sure that at least a million people felt the same way. Because he had that gift, you know. He waved, and there's, look, he saw me. He waved at me. He smiled at me. So when the cardinals arrived to, for the conclave, this is what is in our minds. This is what we're, how do you pick a man like that? The rule of the conclave is governed by a document which is public, so that's why I can talk the document, that John Paul II had published, which gives almost word by word everything that goes on until the, until the voting comes. And we are in the Sistine Chapel. Sistine Chapel is a rectangular chapel which has an altar at one end. And behind the altar is Michelangelo's Last Supper, the great painting of the Last Supper. I'm sorry, the great, of, it, it's the, the Last Judgment, not the Last Supper, the Last Judgment. And it's a very powerful painting right there at the, the, end of the, or the end of the wall. The cardinals are arranged in two banks of tables on either side of the, either side of the wall. I was on, as you look at the altar, I was on the right side. And I was up near the front. You're, you're, you're in there according to your precedence as a cardinal. There were 115 of us voters at that time. I was in, in order number 67, and so my place was in the second row, not the first row, the second row, maybe three from the end, so I was very close to the altar and I could see everything going on. Opposite me was the man who was number one because he was dean of the College of Cardinals, Cardinal Ratzinger, so I could watch him almost directly of course during the whole time. Well. When it's time to vote, according to this uh, program that we followed to the letter, that's public so I can talk about it. I don't want you to think I'm being excommunicated even as I speak. <laughs> uh, you, you, go, you, you get a ballot, and the ballot says in, in Latin, e in summum pontificum, I elect his holy father, then you have a line, and you write the name of the man you're, you're choosing. And you take it and you fold it. So you have this folded and you hold it in your right hand. And as, as, you, as the, the line, they don't call names, but you know where you, where you are. I'm, I'm right in front of the, the ones in the back of the, no, I guess for, for voting it's you the first, the senior goes first. So I'm right in back of the Cardinal Archbishop of, of Bogota in Colombia. And I'm right in front of the retired Archbishop of Dublin, uh, uh, Cardinal Connell. That's much my spot, and we always know where, where we are. So I write my name down, so it's the name of the can of what I'm voting for, and I fold it, and I have it in my hand. And as you go up, you see in front of you the Last Judgment, and there's a, an urn where you put the, the ballot. And before you put the ballot in, there is a... Uh, a I guess a, a framed prayer that you say, and it's an oath. And it's the most serious oath that you can possibly take. And it's not the oath of secrecy, you've taken that before, I guess several times before. But this is what this says. It's in Latin, Testor Christus Dominus, I'll, I'll do it in English. I call as witness Christ the Lord, he who will judge me that the man I am voting for 
is the one who, under God, ought to be Pope. So that's what's scary. It's not, it's really not an election. It's not an election. It's a, it's a discernment of what God wants. I call upon Christ the Lord as witness, he who will judge me, that the one I am voting for is the one who, according to who, under God, I believe ought to be elected Pope. So, and then you put it in. What you are saying is, I shouldn't vote for my buddy. I shouldn't vote for somebody who's gonna be nice to me. I shouldn't vote for somebody who maybe has my ideas or is my countryman or anything like that. I promise to vote as, God, as Christ is my witness. And here you're, you're saying, Testo Christus Dominus, I call on Christ as my, as my witness. And there's the last judgment right in front of you. He who will judge me. It could not be any clearer <laughs> what you're doing, that this is the one I'm voting for. Now, why I tell you this story under hope is because that's really what it's all about. That, that you trust that the Lord will take care of the church. You trust that you as you, all you and your brother cardinals who are voting, that they will give us the person that the Lord wants and that you were part of that, that you have prayed over it, that you have talked to the other cardinals, that you have listened, that you have gotten to know the men around you, that you, you have tried to get the big picture and everything like that, and that ultimately in, the heart, in your own heart, in the prayer of your own heart, you're saying, okay, I'm gonna vote for Cardinal X because I think this is the one the Lord wants, not the one that I want. And, and out of that election came Gordon Ratzinger. And I think that everything we have seen since then has, has proven to us all what a great choice that was. I think we have seen... <laughs> Every time I have been with him, and he's, he's different from his predecessor. You know, we, we used to have lunch, with, even breakfast, with, with JP too. This Holy Father, very quiet, does things. He's a man of study and a man of prayer. So was, of course, so was JP too. But JP too was also a man of the people and a man of, 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 uh, of great uh, exotic uh, actions. But the present, this present Holy Father has even larger groups gathering on his Wednesday audience. And I think part of it, I'm, I'm just, I'm, you got me off. How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, but let me finish now since I started. I think part of it is that John Paul II was a, was a philosopher. And philosophers don't always have to be clear. He was also a poet, and poets are never clear. <laughs> but, ben but Benedict is a theologian, and theologians who are teaching have to be very clear. And so when you read and when you listen to him, it's crystal clear. Even as you, this thing I read earlier, is very beautiful, and it's very clear. You know, John Paul, some of his encyclicals, you had to read three times, and then you're never totally sure that you understood them. But this man, in, in, in what he writes, is always good. So the point that I wanted to make is, even on that great level of the universal church, we need to have confidence in the Lord and confidence in, in the fact that I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. And on, I will put my church on Peter and his successors and they, the, the, the world and the devil and all the evil world will not, will not be able to overcome it. What is said in that large level is also said on the level of you and me. Jesus Christ came for you and me. The fathers of the church have said, 
even if we were the only sinner in the world, Jesus would have gone through this whole passion for you or for me. He did not come to save us in bunches like bananas. He came to save us one by one. His relationship with us is, is not a group relationship. Oh, he loves his church, it's his family, obviously, and he has a relationship with his church on which he builds salvation and to which he gives the sacraments, which are the, the elements and the instruments of salvation, especially the Eucharist and Mass. But more than that, he has a relationship with every single one of us. Monsignor was saying earlier, when he was talking about uh, about this in, in, another, in another sense. He calls us before, before we were born. He calls us before we were conceived. I have known you before your mother conceived you in the womb. And I have loved you even before that. That's the God into, in, in, in which we are called to have our confidence. That's the God in which we are called to have our trust. And in today's world where you can read the papers, I said before, and find so many things going wrong, it's easy for us to say, what happened to God? And some people say he's not interested anymore, or he's not around anymore, or, or they, they pretend that they have reasons to say there is no God, which is such folly. But we know that we cannot always read his pattern in the world. You know that wonderful old story of the, of the tapestry? Apparently when you do a tapestry, you do it from the back. And you never see the front of it until it's all done and you walk around and, and there it is. That's how we must understand the world. We don't see the whole picture. But God does. And we don't always see the whole picture in our own lives. Why did I get sick, someone says to me. Why did my son die, someone says to me. Why did I lose this job when I needed it so badly? Why did my daughter not get into the school that she really wanted so much? Why do bad things happen to good people? And the only answer is that we think they're bad things, but God loves us so much that if we have trust in him, he takes care of us. My will, he says in the prophet Joel, my will is not for your evil, it is for your good. My will, this is what I want, I want your good. Let me work in you a good thing. Let me work in you happiness. Let me work in you the glory that I have wanted to put in you so that you may share it with me forever in the life to come. Trust me, Jesus says. Trust the Father, Jesus says. Put this life that I have given you in my hands because I love you, because I only want good for you. And it is not just that I want the saints to be happy. In the mystery of God's love, he wants us sinners to be happy too. He wants us to find the courage to overcome the sinfulness, the selfishness, the stubbornness, the pride, whatever it is that's holding us back from, from being saints. And he's willing, if you trust him, to work a miracle in your life. Miracles aren't over. If anyone knows that, priests know that. Miracles happen in confession all the time. Miracles happen in in the goodness of lives every, all the time. Miracles happen to good people and to bad because the foolishness of God 
is that he never stops loving us. The foolishness of God is that he died for us even when we were sinners. The foolishness of God is that he will never give up on any of us. So trust him and you will find that he brings you not just to the happiness of everlasting life, but even more profoundly, more awesomely, more wonderfully, that he will give you happiness in this life because you will find it in his love, in his trust, in his face. Amen. God bless you. This is a story about Bishop Dunn as a child that nobody knows. He didn't tell me this story, but everybody in the family knows it, and I got it, I guess, from them. When Bishop Dunn was very young, he was always very hungry. That's why he's so skinny today. <laughs> and when he was in school, he was in a Catholic school, he would, if he saw apples or anything like that, he would put two in his pocket and one in his bag and one in his hand and one in his mouth. And uh, sister saw this, and one day, she had a big bowl of apples right at the beginning of the line where the kids go in order to get their food. And as they were going in, uh, she, she realized that Bishop Dunn was going to take a number of apples and it wouldn't be enough for everybody else. So she put a big sign there. She said, please be aware that you are only to take one apple. Remember, God is watching. So the bishop walks up the line, he starts it, and then he receives the sign. And being a holy man, as he even was as a child, he put the other, the, the other six apples he had put in his pockets, he put them back out, and he only kept one. But he's mad, because he really loves those apples. And as he went through the line, picking the rest of his food up, he still got annoyed. At the end, he saw a big bowl of chocolate chip cookies. So he said, ha. Huh. So he picks out his pen and he makes the sign himself, and he puts the sign up there, and it says, take as many. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has asked Cardinal McCarrick to do many, many things during his time. He's been asked to head committees on immigration, on international policy, on doctrine, on laity, on missions. In 2001, he was installed as Archbishop of Washington, D.C., and that same year, he was elevated to the College of Cardinals by John Paul II. In 2005, he was one of 115 cardinals who participated in the conclave that elected Pope Benedict XVI. He described the experience as humbling and even kind of scary. He has been a leading voice in the Catholic Church in the United States for years, and he continues to be so whether he's retired or not. And now we are blessed to have him with us to talk about hope. I'm delighted to introduce his eminence, Cardinal Theodore e. McCarrick from Washington, D.C. Bill does this. This is the second time he's done it now. And uh, I, I have the feeling that I, I, I say, remember the story of the, the, the uh, Irish wake and the, uh, the, the, the widow was sitting there with, her ch with one of It's again my privilege to introduce Cardinal Theodore E. McCarrick, Archbishop Emeritus of Washington. For those who were not here last night, let me explain that the 76-year-old Cardinal is retired. And as he said, he's thinking of taking a full-time job so he can slow down. <laughs> 48 hours ago, he was in Washington, D.C. 34 hours ago, he landed in Auckland. And in that time, he's already given one talk, celebrated mass, done some media interviews, been around the diocese, and he's prepared for today's speech and tomorrow's talk, and he's ready to celebrate two more masses and I'm not sure I heard a rumor that he cooked lunch today because he was bored. That may not be true. Cardinal McCarrick was ordained a priest in 1958. So next year, please God, will be his golden jubilee. 
His service to the church is simply remarkable. And let me mention just a few things. He's talked about in 1971 to 77, he was secretary for Terence Cardinal Cook in New York, a very, very holy man. In 1977, on the 29th of June, he was named Auxiliary Bishop of New York. That's an interesting date, 29 June 1977. That's the same date that our own Dennis Brown became a bishop. Apostolic Constitution on the Sacrament of Love, where he talks about the Eucharist. And I thought it was so important because it ties in faith and the Sacrament of the Eucharist all together. Holy Father says, as he begins this, the mystery of faith with these words spoken immediately after the words of consecration, the priest proclaims the mystery, read my writing, the priest proclaims the mystery being celebrated and expresses his wonder, great words, the priest expresses his wonder before the substantial change of bread and wine into the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, a reality which surpasses all human understanding. The Eucharist is the mystery of faith par excellence, the sum and summary of our faith. The faith of the church is essentially a Eucharistic faith. Those are beautiful words, and those are the words with which the Holy Father begins his, uh, his very, very moving and very eloquent description of the Eucharist as, as the foundation of, of our faith. That's why yesterday I wanted to start with that. Now, today I want to move on to hope. But first I have to tell you a story about Bishop Dunn. Her sons and the the fellow started talking about the husband. And he said, ah, oh, he said, in all my years, I've never known a better man. He was such an honest man, such a hard worker. He was so good to the people. What a wonderful husband. Oh, he was so good to his wife. And what a grandfather. He took care of all this. And the widow was listening to all this. And she hits a boy and she says, quick, Paddy. Go up and look in the coffin. I think they've switched the bodies. <laughs> That's how I feel after they say all those nice things. I was talking to Father Smith in the hall, and a lady came over, and she said, Are you well rested? And I said, Well, I think I am, but we'll find out during the next uh, 45 minutes. And Father Brown said, Well, if you fall asleep while you're talking, then we'll know. <laughs> now, if you fall asleep while I'm talking, that's all right. You're allowed. Yesterday, we spoke about faith and about how important faith was, and it's the very beginning of everything. I, I didn't have my little book here because I thought we were going to go back and change and then come back. And there was a quotation that I wanted to give you, so I, let me give it here now, just so I, 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 I know that, that you, we put all things together. This is the beginning of Pope Benedict's 